Trisha is a research scholar in University of Oxford uh, uh, and working on the rhino rays of India, uh, their socioeconomic values and conservation. And uh, she is a marine conservationist, uh, conservation scientist, and a PhD student at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on the conservation and the fisheries of sharks and rays in India. So, with this brief introduction, I would uh, invite Trisha to take over the session. Uh, thank you, Amit. Let me just share my screen. Yeah. Um, yeah, can everybody see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yes, thank you so much to Amit and Shrutika and the Satya Bama Institute for inviting me here to give a talk today about my work. Um, I'm very always very excited to share about the things that I do. Um, so, as Amit said, I'm Trisha Gupta, a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And my research primarily focuses on sharks and rays um, and their fisheries and conservation in India, especially on the West Coast, um, which is where I do most of my work. So I think throughout this symposium, uh, it seems like you've got a really nice uh, introduction and um, overview of some really fascinating and different uh, ray species that are found across India and the different kinds of work that's been done on them. So for my talk, I'd like to introduce you to the rhino rays um, and some of my research on these species. They're a really fascinating and unique group of rays. They're also known as shark-like rays because as you can see from their body shape, they do resemble sharks quite a bit in terms of their external morphology, but they are very much rays. So um, let's get into what rhino rays are to begin with. Um, and this is something I think Shrutika mentioned, rhino rays belong to the family Rhinopristiformis, um, and the term rhino rays is generally used to refer to all of these different five families that are found within this group. Um, let me just get the laser pointer. Yeah, so these are the five families that belong to Rhinopristiformis. Um, and as you can see, they're very much within rays. They are batoids, um, despite their shark-like appearance. So for my talk, I will be focusing on this one family mostly, the giant guitar fishes uh, belonging to the family Glaucostegidae. But um, I will also speak about some of the other families within this order. So coming to the giant guitar fish, um, as you can see, there are six species that belong um, to this one family. Um, and in fact, this is actually a bit outdated because the seventh species has been newly discovered um, of the waters of Bangladesh that is still being studying, studied and assessed. So for now, we'll um, stick with these six species. And as many of you might know, when it comes to elasmobranx, um, when, it, when it comes to sharks and rays, these are some of the most threatened species groups in the world with about one third of all elasmobranx species that are currently um, facing the risk of extinction. Now, it, when it comes to this family, the giant guitar fish, this uh, situation is even more dire because all of these six species have been assessed as critically endangered. So they're very much at very high risk of extinction. And this is not just for the giant guitar fish, uh, but when you also look at the wedgefish family, um, Rhinidae, collectively, these two families uh, compose of about 16 species. Nearly all species, I think all except one, um, are critically endangered. So now, what makes these species, what makes guitar fish and wedgefish so particularly threatened, even within elasmobranx? Um, so this has to do a lot with their uh, biological and ecological characteristics, as well as a number of socioeconomic factors. One thing is that um, guitar fish and wedgefish tend to be very slow growing, late to mature and have long gestation periods. So as you can see in this picture, um, most rhino rays, uh, like most other rays, are oviviparous. Um, so similar to the electric rays that you ju just saw. These are live birthing, and this is a gravid female that um, you can see the embryos over here. So this has been caught in a fishing net, and unfortunately, um, yeah, the gravid female didn't survive, neither did the embryos. So you can get a closer look at the uh, embryo over here. So they tend to give birth to a very small number of pups, um, and only about, I think, once, or once a year or once in two years. So because of this, their populations tend to grow um, very slowly as compared to bony fish and also as compared to many other elasmobranch species. So another factor is to do with their fins. Um, of an adult, 
guitarfish or wedgefish, their fins actually fetch the highest rate in the international market, even higher than shark fins. So they use for the same purpose as shark fins, they use for shark fin soup, but because of their larger size, uh, they are highly valuable. And because of this high, high value for these fins, um, in many parts of the world, guitarfish and wedgefish are specifically targeted and intentionally captured by um, different types of fishing vessels um, to sell for their fins. But it's also important to remember that at the same time, most guitarfish and wedgefish are also just caught very commonly as bycatch. They're caught incidentally across all different types of fishing gear all across their range. And they're often retained and consumed by coastal communities as well as communities away from the coast as well uh, have been known to consume their meat. So because of these socioeconomic factors, um, these species tend to be extracted either intentionally or unintentionally at quite a high rate. So for example, this is a group of um, guitarfish that has been caught in um, a boat in Malvin in Maharashtra. And this might not seem like a very large number, but all of this has been caught by one single boat, um, a canoe using a gill net, uh, a non-motorized boat, in fact, that was just fishing very close to the shore. So um, because these species tend to aggregate sometimes, they can be harvested in relatively large numbers like this. And in this case, they were all sold for local consumption and at not a very high value as well. So because of this, these extraction rates can be quite high um, for these guitarfish. And finally, uh, the last factor here, and I'll talk more about this later, is that most guitarfish and wedgefish species live in very um, near shore, coastal and inshore areas. I think, in fact, most species are not found uh, in waters deeper than 100 or 120 meters, um, which is quite shallow. And it is in this coastal zone where you have most uh, human activities and anthropogenic pressures happening, not just fishing, but also various forms of development, pollution, tourism, and so on. So because of this, um, the critical habitats of these species are under threat, which is why these species themselves are so threatened. Um, and we have a clue about what might happen to these species um, if nothing is done by looking at the example of the sawfish. So the sawfish is another group under rhino rays belonging to the family Pristidae. And unfortunately, they're also a very, very highly threatened group so threatened that they've um, virtually disappeared from many parts of their range, especially in waters from Africa and Asia. These uh, populations have drastically declined. And some scientists even say that they might be functionally extinct in some of these ecosystems because their populations are just so low. So um, the waters off the coast of Australia are um, probably one of the last strongholds for most of these sawfish species because they've declined so severely from other parts of the world. So unfortunately, um, guitarfish and wedgefish might share the fate of these sawfish if um, urgent conservation action isn't taken for them. So coming a bit to the context of India, um, as you probably know, India is amongst the top three shark and ray fishing nations. Um, I think we're currently number three after Indonesia and Spain. And when it comes to rhino rays, we do have quite a high species richness of rhino rays. So looking at, um, again, the giant guitarfish specifically, as you can see from this map, we have five um, of the six known species of rhino rays are found within Indian waters, um, which is quite a high diversity uh, that are found in India. But unfortunately, um, despite this high diversity that is found in our waters, um, and despite being one of the top elastomobranch fishing nations, we know very little about most of the rhino ray species that are inhabiting our waters. So similar to the electric rays that were just talked about, rhino rays are also quite poorly studied. There are some papers about uh, and some studies uh, of them that do exist. Um, and they have been getting more attention as well in recent years because of their highly threatened status. But our understanding of these species is still very limited um, beyond just the broader biological facts. Coming to their legal status, um, are rhino rays, um, particularly guitarfish and wedgefish, protected under the Wildlife Protection Act? So as it currently stands, um, three sawfish species and one wedgefish species, um, which is called the giant guitarfish, are protected under the current Wildlife Protection Act. Um, and this is also a bit complicated because this over here is a species complex. So um, it's, all, it's often quite challenging to understand which are the species that's actually protected and to actually enforce this policy. 
Now, um, as some of you may know, there has been an amendment to this Wildlife Protection Act that uh, was passed last year in 2022. And in this amendment, a number of um, rhino ray species have been listed under protection as well um, that you see over here. So including a few more wedge fish species, um, the bowmouth guitar fish, and also the wide nose guitar fish, which I'll be focusing a lot on during my talk. So um, if I understand it correctly, this amendment has been passed by the parliament, uh, but it has not yet been implemented on ground. Now, the challenge here is that, um, as I mentioned, in, in most cases, um, these guitar fish and wedge fish are simply caught as bycatch. So even if they are listed under protection, it does not mean that they're going to stop getting caught. So it's going to be quite challenging to implement this on ground. And also, um, again, as I mentioned, we know so little about these species from their ecology, the kind of habitats they use, um, the seasons that they're caught in, how they interact with fisheries, um, and how people might be affected by these new policies are um, not very clear. So these data gaps need to be addressed if we really want to implement these policies on ground in the most effective way possible. So that's what um, our study did try to focus on addressing these some of these data gaps um, at our case study site, which is in Goa on the West Coast. So why did I choose Goa for my study? Um, this is a bit incidental, um, and this is because um, some of these guitar fish species are known to come very close to shore in some of Goa's beaches um, to very shallow waters. They come in and leave with the waves. So I have a short video here, if it plays, just to give you an idea of how close to shore they really come. Um, so yeah, as you can see, this is a wide nose guitar fish. Um, and this, uh, you can see how shallow these waters are. So they do tend to come to um, practically ankle depth water and you can see them from when you're standing on the beach. So this is uh, what got me really interested in studying guitar fish in Goa because of this behavior. Now this behavior is not necessarily unique to Goa. They have been known to show this kind of um, aggregations and movement towards these very shallow beach waters, even in other parts of the country. Uh, but Goa is where I saw them. So that's where I decided to conduct my study. So these shallow inshore waters uh, might likely be forming possible nursery grounds for these species, um, especially given that it's a lot of juveniles that we often found, uh, that we often saw in these very shallow coastal waters. And unfortunately, because it's such uh, shallow grounds, this is these species are not just threatened by fisheries, but given that it's Goa, they're also facing a lot of threat by the tourism activities that are happening just along the beach and along the coastline. Um, and it's important that these factors are studied more. So our objectives of this study were um, to look bit, a bit more into the ecology of uh, guitar fish, particularly that are found in Goa, specifically their habitat use and seasonality. We wanted to, we wanted to understand their fisheries and socioeconomic values, um, and finally understand attitudes that um, local communities and fishers had towards the conservation of guitar fish. And we addressed all of our objectives using local knowledge of fishing communities, which essentially means that our study was entirely interview based. So we conducted semi structured interviews um, with fishers along the coastline of Goa, both in the north and south district. And we focused a lot of our interviews on um, the local gillnet fishers, but we also did interview fishers working on trawler boats, um, purse scenes, and even on the local show scene fisheries, the rapin um, fishery that you see in this picture over here. And through these interviews, we um, obtained insights on um, the various information that we needed for our objectives. So after these semi-structured interviews, we also conducted a series of key informant interviews um, in Goa only. So what these uh, key informants basically refers to um, people such as uh, community leaders or presidents of the different fisheries unions or societies or in some cases were even um, very elderly and respected fishermen of a particular village, um, sometimes counted as a key informant. And what these key informants did was to give us a better, more in-depth and qualitative understanding of guitar fish and how people use them in these um, regions and also what people might think um, about their conservation. So one thing to point out is that unfortunately, we're not able to collect our data at a species level, um, which is of course what we would have liked to do. But our initial interviews uh, suggested that most fishers had uh, difficulty differentiating between the different guitar fish species, or sometimes even between guitar fish and wedge fish. 
Um, and because of this, we did not want any biases or error in our data. So we decided to conduct our interviews and collect information about the entire family as a whole rather than about specific species. So these interviews are conducted um, by my research assistant, Andrew, and myself. Um, and yeah, this is just an example of uh, some of the interviews that we conducted with Gillnet um, owners in North Goa, I think. So what did we find? Um, when it comes to their habitat use, um, fishers were able to point out various characteristics of habitats that um, guitar fish were often found in, such as sandy habitats near rocks. And they also told us about specific river mouths um, and estuaries in Goa, where they've seen these guitar fish aggregate, um, such as the Baga River and the Talpona River in the south. And because of this information, we're able to broadly map out um, the different habitats and regions in Goa where guitar fish have been known to occur, though at quite a broad resolution. And these, this gives us an idea of potential nursery grounds for these species. And coming to their seasonality, um, according to uh, the Fisher interviews, the months right after the monsoon, so especially September and October, were the peak seasons for guitar fish. This is when they were seen the most in the, uh, in the water, and this is when fishers would also encounter them the most. Whereas the summer months, um, especially April and May, were uh, considered to be the season where they would not see much of guitar fish in the water. And they even suggested that the guitar fish move to deeper waters because it's too hot. Um, so this gives us an idea of what seasons need to be focused on when it comes to designing any kind of um, conservation interventions or management. Um, Fishers also did suggest that uh, during the monsoon and again right after the monsoon is when they think that guitar fish were breeding because that's when they would see a lot of newborn uh, pups found in the waters. So when it comes to their fisheries, um, it was clear that guitar fish were caught across all different types of fishing gear, gill nets, trawler nets, purse scenes, um, and even the show scenes. So it, um, yeah, it was not very selective. But almost all interviewed fishers agreed that uh, it was the gill nets that would catch them the most and would encounter guitar fish most frequently, um, which was surprising as we had initially thought that it might be uh, the trawlers that would catch them the most. And what was interesting is that um, guitar fish in Goa were entirely bycatch, so that there was no fisher who would uh, target or catch them intentionally. Some of the fishermen mentioned that in the past, um, during their father or grandfather's time, um, there would be some targeted fishing for guitar fish and wedge fish, and they even had a specific gill net to use of a particular mesh size that would be used to catch these species. But now because um, apparently their numbers have declined so much and um, apparently they don't get um, big size individuals of guitar fish especially, they don't do this targeted form of fishing anymore and it forms entirely by catch in this region. So once they're caught, how are they used? Um, so fishers would either sell guitar fish in the market, take them home for consumption, or discard them back into the water, dead or alive. And as you can see, it's actually quite a high percentage um, of fishers, nearly 70% of the interviewed fishers said that they would discard guitar fish back, not all the time, but sometimes. And the post-capture use seemed to uh, depend largely on the size of the guitar fish caught. So if it's a small size individual, there's a greater chance of it being um, thrown back into the water. And if it's a larger size individual, it would be sold or taken home for consumption. We also find uh, found very strong differences between the north and south of Goa, where in the north, um, fishers had a greater chance of discarding guitar fish, so they didn't often sell or consume it. Whereas in the south, fishers would um, very rarely discard, and they would always either sell it or consume it, uh, no matter what the size. So it was interesting to see how um, even something simple as the post-capture use varied so much, um, even within a small state such as Goa. But it was clear that um, when these species were sold in the market, they were sold for um, a very small value, so they did not fetch very high profits. And even when they're consumed at home, they were consumed on average um, maybe only once or twice a month, um, so they did not probably did not form a staple or an important food source for local communities. So alongside these um, socioeconomic uses, we also looked a bit into something known as relational values, which um, in simple terms, relational values refer to uh, the different kinds of meanings, cultural values, relationships that um, the community may have for these species beyond just the profits and the monetary gains that they get from it. 
So you have instrumental values, which as I uh, mentioned earlier, most fishers would sell these species um, at the market for some amount of profits. So that would be an instrumental use. And then under relational values, through our interviews, we also identified a number of other cultural values and relationships that people would express for these species. So just to give you a few examples of these relational values, um, for example, there were um, a number of fishers that spoke about how they particularly enjoyed consuming guitar fish in the evenings um, with their drink. They, they would talk about how that pairs really well and it's something that they enjoyed after a hard day's work um, to eat guitar fish meat alongside their drinks. So this is something that can be quoted as a, a recreational value for these species. Um, other fishermen would talk about uh, various non-fishing experiences that they had um, with the guitar fish, such as childhood memories of trying to spot these species in the water. And a few others also mentioned that um, these guitar fish were considered lucky because they would be a bit hard to see in the water. So when you would spot them, um, you're considered to be lucky or have a lucky day. So this just gives you gives us a very brief understanding of um, how a species like guitar fish, despite the fact that it's bycatch and it's a low economic value, it can still be embedded um, within the cult cultural values of a community and people can have different kinds of relationships and associations with it. So the last part of our study looked at conservation um, and this was enti conducted entirely with the key informants, as I mentioned earlier. So we would discuss uh, qualitatively with these key informants about what they would feel and what the rest of the community would feel if guitar fish were listed under protection and if they could no longer catch them, what would their attitudes be towards this? How would it impact their livelihoods? Um, and would they even comply with these measures if they were implemented on ground? And we found that when it comes to, um, uh, given we, it comes to guitar fish or rhino rays in general, all the fishers, all the key informants we interviewed were actually quite positive um, about their conservation because they said that guitar fish are anyway not caught in very large numbers. And um, it's uh, also, as I said, has a very low economic value. So even if they're listed under protection and they're banned, um, it won't really have a very large impact on the livelihoods of fishers. And they would comply with these regulations if they had to. So they suggested that um, avoiding uh, catching these species would be difficult because they are bycatch and they're found alongside crabs and other target species for a lot of these fishers. But they did suggest that live release would be um, a very feasible option, similar again to the electric rays. Uh, these species can be released back into the water after being caught. They're also known to have a fairly high survival rate uh, upon capture. So they tend to survive even hours after uh, being caught and pulled out of the water. And this in does indicate that releasing them back into the water, they would most likely survive. Um, and this is quite a positive finding for these species. So similarly, we asked them um, what would happen if sharks, for example, were to be protected. And we found very different um, opinions and attitudes about this um, expressed by these key informants because Sharks are a high value species. They are targeted by some communities in Goa and they do fetch um, quite high profits. So we did find that most of the interviewed um, fishers would say that um, had negative at attitudes about the idea of sharks being listed under protection because um, as I said, they're high value and they said that they probably wouldn't comply with such measures if they were to be implemented. We finally spoke to fishermen about um, what they felt, whether compensation was needed if they had to um, release guitar fish and other rhino rays back into the water. And we got quite mixed opinions about this. Majority of fishers did say that they felt that no compensation was needed because again, it's a low value species. And some fishers also said that it's everyone's duty to release them if they were protected. Um, it's something that they should just do. But others did say that compensation would be needed and it would be good to uh, make up for any economic losses that they might face. Um, and it would also encourage and incentivize all fishers to actually comply with these measures. So just to conclude, um, what did we find from our study overall? Um, one is that I would really like to highlight the importance of local knowledge because we didn't, uh, we practically knew nothing about guitar fish from this region, from Goa, uh, apart from a couple of studies on um, their catch and trawlers and their diets. So through local knowledge, we were able to identify a bit about um, the kind of habitats they were found in, potential nursery grounds, um, their seasonality, and also the kind of fishing gear and seasons that need to be targeted for any kind of future intervention. 
So this local knowledge needs to be um, focused on a lot more. And it's also important that it's brought and combined with uh, mainstream science um, so that the knowledge and opinions of local communities are also considered when it comes to developing fishery management plans. Um, we did find, as I said, that guitar fish uh, being entirely bycatch had low economic values and fishing communities had positive attitudes towards their conservation. And this story does suggest that live release measures uh, for guitar fish might be a good strategy um, for these critically endangered species in this region. And this then provides um, a pathway or a way for um, the new policy changes in the Wildlife Protection Act to be implemented in regions like Goa, where these species um, form low, uh, low value bycatch, live release, live release measures would probably be an effective strategy for their conservation. Um, and just a bit in terms of next steps, when it comes to guitar fish in Goa, we're initiating some future research, um, particularly on their habitat ecology and nursery grounds, because our current study gave us a broad understanding of where these potential nursery sites might be. And we're interested in using more sophisticated and targeted research tools to better understand um, these critical habitats of guitar fish, because then they can be better protected. Um, we're also very interested in understanding more about the human dimensions, um, again, of guitar fish and other elasmobranchs and how people interact with them and the kind of socioeconomic values they hold, because only through understanding that can conservation interventions be designed and, and implemented. So even simple live release measures, um, I think as somebody mentioned earlier, it's really important to have a good rapport with the community to understand their perspectives and to do this in a bottom-up approach so that they're equally involved all throughout the process. Um, and this is something that we would be interested in doing long-term in this region. And finally, it's very important to spatially expand um, the study and this kind of understanding because this might be the case in Goa, but um, a lot of evidence from different um, researchers who are working in different parts of the country. And maybe a lot of people in the audience today uh, can also say this, that in different parts of the country, guitar fish and wedge fish are not necessarily only bycatch. In many regions, they are also targeted or they're opportunistically caught and sold for their fins. They do, they can fetch very high values. And in those cases, simple strategies such as live release um, through community participation might not work and different strategies might be needed. So it's critical that we actually focus on understanding um, the different social economic values and interactions with fisheries across different sites in the country. Um, so that's it. Um, that's a quick overview of my research. And I'd like to quickly acknowledge my funders uh, for my PhD, the Levine Family Foundation, and my supervisors and the research team uh, that made this research possible. And of course, the fishing communities of Goa, because this research is entirely based on their knowledge and their traditions that have been collected over uh, generations. Um, so I'm grateful that they participated in the study. And I'm happy to take any questions now. I've also provided my contact details if anybody wants to reach out or ask me any questions or discuss this further. Thank you. I can just stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Thanks, Trisha, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I would invite the participants to ask questions if you have any. Uh, you can raise the hand and I can unmute you or else you can also write in the chat box.